blue is sky and then white is earth and red is a fire or jungle green is a forest yellow is the wind the some of the mantra om mane pame ho they have a six letter six meaning and the people is a believe about the mountain and nature all sherpa people is a pray the one mountain every breath they have a one monastery and they have a monk they call it a bursa give the three foot of monks monks is a pray the morning and evening they have a incense and the food twice is a pray and play music yeah then we are pray all people pray the good luck and then we go Here we are again, and successful. For those who don't know, I've been planning an island peak expedition for the good part of over a year, since probably about February 2022. So this expedition's been on my mind for quite some time, and it's been a very massive source of motivation for me. It's, yeah, it's just been incredible. Getting to the top of Island Peak has been a pretty large goal of mine for the better part of a year and it feels just fantastic to have said that I've been able to do it big dream of mine the beginning hopefully of many more things to come uh, trekking in Nepal ever since I started hiking has just been something that wasn't really like I didn't really believe that it was within my grasp to do which is good because stepping outside of your comfort zone is very important and this was one thing that you know in your mind can I do it maybe not but that's what drives me and that's what drives a lot of other people too in any case from this experience I've gained a lot of information that I feel would be quite valuable to others who were in my position it can all be a bit daunting having to well at least for me it was going overseas for the first time but going into a third world country that you don't understand, they don't speak the same language as you. Everything that you need to do to prepare for an expedition like this can be overwhelming. Various information sources online can give conflicting responses and you can just end up chasing your tail and wondering if what you're doing is right or wrong or what is the right way to go about it. And that was at least my experience, at least specifically with Island Peak because there doesn't seem to be a lot of people talking about their experiences with Island Peak, at least in a decisive manner as well, where you can go, right, yep, that's exactly what I need to do. So this is what I'm wanting to hopefully give to you, is some sort of definitive guide, at least with the information that I've collected, a guide to all the aspects of Island Peak, including trekking to Everest Base Camp, if that's also something that you're interested in doing. An important thing to note, and one of the more crucial things that you get right, is the company that you choose to go trekking with, if you choose to go with a trekking company. Of course, if you are a bit more self-sufficient, self-reliant, and have more experience, you may choose to go by yourself and just go with one guide. But for me and our group, we chose to go with a local trekking company, which was good for price and good for local knowledge as well. You'll find that when you're out there having people on your side who know what to expect and have done it before and are well experienced and well versed, such as the guides that I had on my trip, 
you'll just be in a really good position if you can have those kinds of people with you. Um, so I think local trekking companies are definitely ones to consider. I personally went with a company called Scenic Nepal. Right, so leading on from where I left off about a month and a bit ago with my pre-trip packing list, um, I got most of it right, which was really, really good. Uh, obviously, you'd hope that you did get predominantly everything right, but I got all the important stuff right and a lot of all the little details. And obviously, I'm not perfect, so I did get some things wrong, but it didn't really affect my trip that much at all. There are a few things that I didn't mention during my pre-trip list or some things that I'd like to add onto that. And those would be my Gore-Tex layers that I've got here. I believe I did mention the jacket in the first part, but this is just a this is a three layer Gore-Tex jacket, which came very much in handy during my climb and during the very windy stages of the afternoons in Nepal. Um, I did see some people recommending to take this, but you're not going to really need it. But this came, this was on more times than it wasn't up higher. So definitely a very valuable piece of equipment and one to focus on when you're going over, especially for climbing. And another important piece of equipment for probably just climbing specifically would be full zip Gore-Tex pants. Such as these. Now full zip's important in case you need to put them on quickly and you need to put them on over things such as mountaineering boots and crampons. Um, I didn't have those pants with me during my climb. I bought some cheap the North Face pants in Tamel. They got me up Island Peak and barely got me back down because by the time that I was walking down, the belt had failed and my pants were slipping down. So if you're going to climb, buy some good pants and full zip is good if you can get pants that have full zip, but if you're only needing it for the climb, you're going to probably be wearing it from the beginning may not be absolutely vital and you can get away with it if you have just some standard Gore-Tex pants. Um, if you're not going to be climbing, if you're just going to be doing trekking in the Kumbu region or any other region of Nepal, you would easily just be able to get away with using some standard rain pants. However, I would recommend using a Gore-Tex jacket because the wind can really sap it out of you and you have to have a a good layer of protection that I don't think a, a light jacket is going to be able to do for you. <laughs> Another item that I got a little bit wrong, so not entirely wrong and it didn't cause too much hassle, but there'd be my gloves. I had quite large gloves that um, were really good in the colder sections of the island peak climb and as we got onto the glacier and things started to heat up i didn't necessarily need to have gloves that were that thick and they did hinder my climbing ability a little bit with um using the juma so i couldn't get all my fingers into into the juma a lot of other people on my team and also the climbing sherpa they had big gloves for the morning part which was good and then as the day heated up, they took them off and they used a thinner glove that was more dexterous that also had a little bit of insulation and weather protection for the climb. That way they were able to easily work carabiners, they were able to work all of the climbing gear and had no hassles at all there. Whether as I was fumbling around with my gloves that didn't even have glove leashes, I had to construct some makeshift glove leashes. So tip. If you're missing glove leashes, there are none in Namche. I check every single store. One more thing I forgot to add, micro spikes. You may need them, you may not. We bought them in Kathmandu, good to have just in case. Um, it didn't snow very heavily at all. During our trek, we weren't presented with any situations where we needed to use micro spikes. We were meant to do the Kongma La high pass, 
which would have been probably the only day in which we would have needed to use them. But we opted to move down to conserve our energy for Island Peak rather than go and do the high pass. So we never ended up using them. So depending on your trek and the time of year, micro spots might be handy to have with you. I would say that if you're going over to Nepal and your aim is to hire all of your climbing equipment in Chukung, I would seriously reconsider that. If you have the ability to have your own equipment or hire equipment that is of a better quality, then that's going to absolutely skyrocket your chances of getting into the top of Island Peak. Now, the reason I didn't have any trouble whilst other people in my group did, which could have been due to luck of the draw, but also due to the fact that I only needed to hire my technical climbing equipment and I also knew what I was looking for. So I only needed to hire my mountaineering boots, crampon, ice axe, uh, harness, carabiners, juma, and uh, descender. Oh, yes, helmet too. But other people in the group, and this was the failure point, they'd hired clothing items like gloves and gown jackets and other items like uh, sleeping bags as well. This was the failure point for them. This made it so that they weren't able to attempt the climb, which was very unfortunate. However, from the experience, I'm able to let others know what to expect. And so hopefully this will help other people reach the summit. So if you are going to be attempting Island Peak, make sure if you are going to hire anything, it's only the technical climbing equipment. And if I would add to that, I would have your own mountaineering boots because the boot options that I was seeing and helping select because it was all just, it was kind of a mess, but for Island Peak in Chukung, the specific hire shop did not have double boots, which is very important if you want to maximize your foot safety because it can get cold. Luckily, it wasn't too cold and the larger single layer boots were fine for that specific day but maybe in times where it's colder such as leading into later november or very early march then a single layer boot's probably not going to be able to do it for you so if you have the ability to do so get your own mountaineering boots now what i got wrong which luckily isn't too large of a list but toiletries i went very minimal and I had a few things that I wish I did have. That would be a larger towel because I only had a tiny little microfiber towel. And the time I did have a shower, it was very, very awkward drying and I froze. So that was an absolute mistake to only bring a tiny towel and it was a mistake to shower on that day. Other things that I wish I bought in my toiletry kit were some sort of moisturizer for uh, problems with windburn and sunburn and a small little bottle of soap to have been able to use for the shower as well. If you do plan a shower, if you don't want to shower at all, um, don't worry about it. But the luxury is there on the Everest Base Camp Trek, so you might as well use it. Another place where I fell short was in my medicine department. I haven't thought about a lot of the possibilities of actually getting sick or fairly sick on the trail in terms of colds. And I had neglected to bring more painkillers and more cold and flu type drugs. I would definitely be bringing more of those. Another place where I got wrong would be in the money department. I tried to go quite budget, but not leaving myself enough of a, a safety padding with money. So luckily, Visa works well in Nepal. And I had no problems with getting additional cash when needed or paying by card, which was also quite handy. But out on the trail, you won't have that luxury, obviously. So you're going to need to have a good amount of rupees with you. So that pretty much sums up what you're going to need to pack. And if you need a refresher of the majority of what to bring with you, you can check out my pre-trip video. So we'll move on to a few more important topics to discuss about trekking in the Kumbu. Um, one of them being flights and weight restrictions. Now, recently what has happened in Nepal is flights from 
Kathmandu to Lukla have been moved uh, during peak trekking seasons to an airport that's five hours uh, bus slash van ride away from the capital uh, from Ramchak Airport. Now, what this does is it decreases flight time and it also increases the likelihood that your flight is actually going to go ahead. So it's much easier for them to predict weather from a closer destination rather than flying straight from Kathmandu. If you can stomach a five hour van ride, I'd suggest doing it. Otherwise, if you want to roll the dice with the weather, then taking a flight from Kathmandu to Lukla is going to save you a bit of time and it's going to save you a midnight wake up and five hour bus ride. So you can wait which option is going to suit you. You can still fly from Kathmandu, but if it's already been coordinated that you're to fly from Ramchap, I'd say you might as well just do it. Just try and get some sleep. It's not, not too possible, but yeah, it's an experience. Now, another topic I'd like to touch on is shopping. So if you are wanting to leave some of your shopping to when you get there due to any reason, it is possible. There is a couple bits of information online that suggests for you to not do that, but I had a good look throughout the stores in Tamel and in the Numche Bazaar as well, and they offered really good gear at actually surprisingly good prices as well. Cheaper, in fact, than Australia. So it may depend on where you're coming from. Maybe the prices are a bit more expensive if you're coming from, say, Europe, for example, um, in which case you might want to just buy from your home country. Otherwise, if you do need to buy some stuff when you're over in Kathmandu or Nepal, very reasonable for you to do so. And there's great selection. You can pretty much find anything that you need. Mentioned previously as well, the ATMs in Kathmandu and Namche are pretty good. They accept the majority of the cards. Uh, from a few people in my expedition, I heard that they were having some issues with specific types of cards, but I used a Visa card and had no worries. It was able to take out money from the ATMs. I was able to use my card to pay for certain things in shops all the way up uh, into Namche. And using ATMs is definitely viable all the way up to there. But past that, I probably wouldn't trust the ATMs and I didn't see anyone else do so either. Another thing that's kind of hard to uh, research and predict whilst you're not in the country is the weather. Being weather and being in the mountains, it can change, but overall the trend seems to be, at least in the April to May trekking season, fairly warm and sunny in the mornings all the way up into the afternoons. Then as the afternoons roll in, it can be quite windy and cloud cover can occur, and that's when the temperature starts to drop and it gets a little bit cold. Um, in terms of just general temperatures, down lower on the trail in Lukla, you would expect the daytime maximum to be around, say, uh, 15 degrees, getting down to around zero. Num chase, it's around a maximum of five to just below zero. And as you move higher again, you're going to sit around a maximum of, say, around zero to two, going down to minus five in places around 4,000 meters and keep moving up and get to around 5,000 meters in places such as Chukung and Gorak Shep, you're going to experience temperatures around minus 10 being coldest in April, which is apparently quite warm for there and daytime maximums of around zero. But again, with the wind, the wind was very cold, which is why I recommend getting a good Gore-Tex jacket. I can't say for certain what the weather is in the October-November trekking season, but that's coming out of monsoon season from September, which I've heard can be a little bit damp, and the trends show that that usually clears up moving into October, and then it's similar weather, if not maybe a little bit colder. But again, I can't say for certain, but can say for certain that April weather is good, and a point to make about the unpredictability of mountain weather is we had good weather for three weeks, perfect, had rain the first night and rain the last night, which worked out really well. But the week after we left, 
massive storms came in which were easily forecastable in Nepal and that completely dumped snow across the entire trail and caused fairly severe weather conditions. So that shows what can happen. But overall, the weather is really good. Now, daily expenses, what can you expect to be paying on the trail each day? Just for starters, I'd say around 1,500 rupees to 2,000 rupees, which translates into roughly 15 USD to 20 USD ballpark. That's how uh, our team ended up figuring it out to make it make it make sense for us. Certain types of things that you're going to be wanting to pay for would be stuff like extra drinks, extra food, Wi-Fi, charging, or hot showers at the tea houses. That's that's pretty much all that you can pay for. Um, and then obviously the higher you move up the trail, the more these things are going to cost. Uh, one thing I will mention that people might be buying a lot of is bottled water, and I would highly recommend not going the bottled water route because you can easily purify your water. You can use water purification tablets like I did, and you can use uh, filtered water systems, and you can greatly reduce the amount of plastic that you leave behind on you can greatly reduce the amount of plastic that you leave behind in the national park and you can also save yourself some money too. I didn't get sick at all from using purification tablets. I did take care to make sure that I wasn't splashing water onto any of the mouthpieces that I drank from and I wasn't taking from like streams. I was taking from the tea house taps and I had no problems. Good way to save money and it's also a good way to save the national park too. Another topic that I didn't seem to be able to find much information online on was training specifically for a trekking peak. Um, I'll let you know what I did, and I'm probably at the extreme end. So, I mean, if you want to be really prepared, then you can copy what I did, but there are a lot of other people who were also successful in their summit who did less than I did. I did roughly three strength training sessions, two lower body and one upper body, consisting of um, your main strength exercises, stuff like squats and step-ups, deadlifts, pull-ups, things in that nature. I did weighted pack training up to about just over 20 kilos. I did that twice a week up a um, fairly uneven track, getting around 500 meters of elevation gain each session over about five kilometers. I also did a little bit of swimming during the summertime seasons for Australia, which was good, but wasn't a consistent thing that I did. I trained martial arts as well, which also was very helpful. These things you can swap out with any sort of aerobic activity like running, jogging, cycling, things in that nature. Most importantly, in my belief, I did very hard training hikes, which I say importantly because I believe that they helped mainly for the mental side of the training, helped with mental strength and able to keep pushing even when it was hard. And honestly, during the entire Island Peak climb, I never once had any doubts in my mind about anything. I had that strength with me. I'd been through situations that were equally as tough and I was able to push through and easily make it to the top. If you have the ability to get out into hard environments and do quite long training hikes very frequently, I did them every week. I did at least 20 kilometers and at least a thousand meters of elevation gain and that was probably one of the things that gave me an edge over Island Peak to be able to make it to the top. Even though I'm from Australia and the mountains are nowhere near as high, it, they're still very difficult. So just different challenges. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about the trek and my experience and what you can experience uh, trekking to Everest Base Camp and then back around to the other side of the valley to Chukum to prepare for Island Peak. Um, lower part of the trail can be a bit monotonous up and down so losing 
elevation, gaining elevation just repeatedly. So if on your itinerary it seems to be show uh, a lesser elevation gain, it's more likely going to be a lot more than that. And that stays true throughout the entire trek, actually. Um, good term called Nepali Flat. So that's what a lot of the trail is. Nepali Flat is that. Now, lower down on the trail was quite easy to do. Uh, obviously, the elevation is not as high at that point. And you'll eventually get to one of the famous parts of the trail, the Namche Staircase, which is that you climb up to the Namche Bazaar. I personally had no problems with it. In fact, there's, uh, there's footage of me dancing my way up <laughs> the trail, listening to some music to get it over and done with. Um, so, yeah. I also didn't see anyone having any serious issues getting up. Just take it nice and slow. Frequent breaks, lots of water, no problems. The middle part of the trail is where you can start to um, feel the thrill of the Himalayas. You get to start to see all of the big peaks surrounding you, all the 6,000 metre peaks and some 7,000 metre peaks the further along you go. Um, one of the best parts of the trail is the trail going from Namche up to Dingreche. That part is quite hard. Again, Nepali flat and also big drops and big gains still. Similar to the Namche staircase, which is one of the areas where you gain the most elevation in one day. But throughout the trail, that's just going to happen. Um, but the trail contours beautifully along the side of the mountain. And you're on the edge of the valley and you've got massive peaks to one side and river flowing down in the middle is just one of the most beautiful parts. You had the small shrines as well along the way. It just felt amazing walking along that part. It was just so beautiful. And then as the higher you go, again, you can start to notice the changing of scenery slowly, slowly less and less plants and um, trees, you'll notice that the trees will completely disappear at around 4,000 metres and you're left with just almost like a high altitude desert really. I really appreciated that change. I was able to see that in Australia. You can see the bush change the higher you go. So being able to see that but in a completely different environment was really interesting. As you move up from Dingbeche village which is at about four and a half thousand meters and you move around to the higher villages of the Everest base camp trek you'll be walking over a bit more rocky terrain and especially so once you get onto the glacier it's extremely rocky uh, and narrow in places as well and quite crowded so you'll have to take care of porters and yaks and horses passing you you'll notice also very quickly that in the towns and the tea houses, especially in well, peak trekking season, it's going to be very, very crowded. So do your best to try and keep away from the tea houses as much as possible if you want to avoid getting sick, which is where a lot of the people in our group got sick because we were in quite crowded tea houses. Now, walking back from Everest Base Camp, it was kind of a kind of a relief to be getting out of there. I wasn't expecting it to be as busy as it was and that was definitely one of the things that was uh, a bit of a letdown for me is that I didn't really expect it to be that busy and I just wanted to get away from the people so it was a really nice change when our group went back to Dingreche and then walked up to the village of Chukung where there were the only people who were in Chukung were there to climb Island Peak so it was really good to just skip the crowds and, and just having our group walk through the valley and walk across the Imja Glacier over to the base of Island Peak ready for the climb. Now the fun part, the part you're all waiting for, the part that I was waiting for, the climb. Now Island Peak base camp is situated right at the bottom of Island Peak in between the peak and Imja Lake. Our summit day started at midnight on the dot, got up, had breakfast, left camp at about 1am. First part of the 
climb is just a steep hiking trail, really, all the way up to high camp at 5,600 meters. From high camp, you move through a gully of loose rock, which includes a few sections of rock scrambling. And this gets progressively steeper the higher you go. You'll start to notice snow and ice. And you'll eventually break onto a quite exposed ridgeline. And at the end of that ridgeline, you'll appear onto the glacier, which is at the crampon point. From there, you put your harness and helmet on, your crampons on, and you get ready to start doing some fixed line work. For us, we had one major crevasse crossing, which was over a five metre ladder. And not as bad as you might experience. I mean, I'm not too phased by the danger of the height. So I was just focusing on stepping across fine. You have people to hold the fixed ropes either side of you to keep them taut as well. So that wasn't really an issue. After you make your way up the first steep section of the glacier, you'll enter a really large flat section, which is the the walk up to the beast, which is the 100 metre wall, which for us was quite hard this season because the glacier only extended about halfway and then the other half of this wall was rock. And in crampons and on an incredibly steep angle, after already walking for about six hours, it was incredibly tough. One of the hardest parts, definitely. Working your way up the head wall when it's ice wasn't too bad. Footholds were obviously easy. I I know how to use crampons. I've had prior experience. So having a little bit of technical know-how in regards to the crampons was definitely useful. But otherwise, people who hadn't used them before had no problems either with this section. And during the rock section, this is when I saw there being a bit of... Um, a struggle for a few people who didn't know how to use the crampons because in some sections of that climb I was able to skip a bit of the difficulty by doing a bit of front pointing which is a technical move with crampons that you wouldn't really need to do on Island Peak but for my situation I actually had to to get up certain pitches but no problem it was difficult but definitely still doable and Getting onto the, the ice ridge is a bit of a <gasps> moment. <laughs> you know, almost done. Fuel tank very low, and you just got to push out that final little section. It's not not super duper narrow, but it is fairly exposed. But you've got the rope right next to you. You're roped in, and if you're going with a good team, with good Sherpa, they'll take good care of you at the top. If you're uh, feeling a bit exhausted like we were and you'll eventually make it to the summit like I did and it was fantastic and you've got absolutely gorgeous views of the valley and Amadavlan and then you'll look to your right and then still two kilometres upward is Lutze, the south face of Lutze which is just unbelievable so you still feel tiny even though you're at the top and coming back down was definitely the hardest part, as it usually is. Um, that's just an abseil, so technically a lot easier. Uh, just got to make sure that you're watching where you're going, going nice and slow, so you avoid getting any bangs and bruises, which a few people did who rushed to the bottom. Uh, I took my time and had no problems, and slowly worked the way back down. The walk back down the gully just past Crampon Point was a bit uh, difficult being tired, but other than that, was able to drag myself back into base camp and just have relief wash over you that you've done it and that it was all not for nothing. Things I'd do differently next time, however, is rethink my hydration system. I didn't use a big down jacket designed for climbing, which apparently some of them have inner pockets where you can store uh, water bottles to keep them warm. So I had all my water in my pack, which caused issues being that I had to go and get someone to get it out for me when I wanted to have a drink and it wasn't 
immediately available, which makes it so that you don't drink enough. And that happened to me. I got a bit dehydrated on my climb. So if I was to approach another climb like I will in the future, I'd think of a way to have water on you still at all times and available for you to grab whenever you want that doesn't get frozen. So obviously a camelback system is fantastic because the straw is just right over your shoulder, but that straw is going to freeze. An idea I've had that I hadn't tested is to use one of the camelback backpacks inside of your down jacket and to keep the straw nice and warm inside of that. But I don't know, haven't tested it out. So if someone's got any ideas that have actually worked or any systems that have worked, then uh, let others know and let me know because that would definitely come in handy. And then as mentioned before, the gloves as well. I would have liked to have remembered to pack with me a change of gloves for more technical work once it started to get a bit warmer but wasn't the end of the world and I had very warm hands. An important topic I forgot to mention is altitude sickness and how to deal with it on the trail. Obviously altitude affects people differently and it can affect the same person differently each time that they go to altitude. So even experienced climbers who've been to altitude many times can get sick such as Sherpas your Sherpa could get sick more likely than not you will also experience some sort of acute mountain sickness symptoms most likely just a light headache which if that's all you're experiencing that's completely fine you don't have to worry about that just follow a few simple rules to trekking at altitude that I'll go over now and you shouldn't have any problems first one is to always walk slowly our group abided by the rule bistari bistari, which means slowly, slowly. We would take our time at altitude, take our time during the day. Might only be a 10 kilometer walk, but it would take us about five to six hours. That way, pretty much all members of the team were able to complete the walk each day very easily. And only a few of us, which was by chance, were affected by altitude, myself included in that, unfortunately. Another important thing to remember is to stay hydrated and more so the higher you go because your body is going to be using more water. Good rule of thumb is to drink between three and five liters a day and that includes drinks such as teas and juices. But try and drink about a liter before you leave in the morning, two liters whilst you're trekking and then when you get to your destination rehydrate again drink another litre of water, have some warm drinks and make sure that you're not going to let yourself get dehydrated because that can accelerate symptoms of altitude sickness quite quickly. I'd like to say a quick word on Dymox which is commonly suggested to deal with altitude sickness. Um, not a doctor obviously, just a hiker. So this is just my experience and from what I've gathered from other people. Obviously, it's best to go and consult your doctor first. I would try and avoid taking Dymox until you absolutely need to. If your altitude sickness gets to the point where your headaches are getting worse and they're not being alleviated by painkillers, it might be a good idea to talk to your guides and see if they recommend you to take Dymox. Small doses of Dymox seem to be the way to go. I wouldn't take full tablets because that can prompt the symptoms of taking Dymox to appear and those symptoms are the same as altitude sickness. Some not so much, so a lot of our expedition team used a half dose of Dymox being half a tablet in the morning and half a tablet at night and the symptoms that we experienced were just tingly fingers and toes and ever so slightly so not really major at all but for everyone who took it and took the small dose they had no side effects and it dramatically helped them to acclimatize properly this is not me telling you to take Dymox this is just my experience and my team's experience from using it so make your own decision and another important rule about 
uh, trekking and climbing at altitude is to make sure that once you're above 3,500 meters to only ascend roughly 500 meters in elevation a day. This will allow your body time to acclimatize properly. And another rule, if you need to ascend more than that in a day, is to ensure that you sleep lower than the highest altitude that you gained. So if you go up to 5,000 meters from 4,000 meters, so big jump, make sure you sleep at around 4,500 meters. So that's all I can pretty much jabber away at you. That's all of the lessons that I've learned and all of the important things that I think people should know. Overall, it was just the best time of my life being someone who wants to get into mountaineering coming from Australia where the mountains are a little bit rounded at the top. It was just an absolutely fantastic experience to be able to live in those mountains for three weeks and to be able to experience the culture and just the fantastic people as well. All of the Sherpas and guides, they're just the nicest people on the planet and it's no wonder that I've heard Nepal being called the land of smiles. I'm sure if you're planning an Everest Base Camp and Island Peak Expedition that you're going to have the time of your life. And if you're following everything that I've mentioned in this video, your time's going to be even better. So if you found any of this information useful, I'd really appreciate it if you liked the video and commented anything that you found interesting. And make sure to follow along with my short series that I'm making on my expedition to Island Peak because that will also help you to get even more insight into what the experience was like. Till next time.